This afternoon's event uh, examines the politics of addiction. It actually builds on a panel discussion we had Tuesday earlier in the Institute here on uh, the problems of the opioid, opioid crisis here in the Northwest. Um, we're fortunate today to have with us a panel of international experts, and we were able to corral them here as a result of a book um, conference that's being co-hosted by the Foley Institute and the School of, Public, of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. I have to remember what that stands for every time. Um, and I want to thank Amy Mazur, who's not here right now, uh, for all her work in organizing that conference and also in putting together our panel. So, um, so we know that addictive behavior is responsible for many deaths uh, and untold social costs around the globe. Overdoses from heroin and other opioids alone, alone account for more than 27,000 deaths in the United States. Yet we are still a long way from understanding the exact causes of addictive behavior and what public policies are effective in combating it. And that's what our panel this afternoon will discuss. I'm going to turn over the rest of the time now to my colleague in PPPA, uh, Bill Cavasenci, who is a, a professor of bioethics. And he's going to introduce, uh, I guess, the panel a little bit more and then each of our panelists in turn. Well, let me say one last thing before I relinquish the stage. After the panel, I want to invite you to stick around. We're going to have a little wine and cheese reception, if you're of age. <laughs> stick around for some wine and cheese afterwards as well. Bill. Thank you all for coming. So I'm uh, serving as the moderator today, um, and uh, I'm going to start by introducing each of the panelists. They're going to give about a 15 or 20 or so minute presentation, and we're hoping that we'll leave some time at the end for questions from you all and for discussion as well. So sitting to my immediate right is Dr. Andre Hoffmeyer. He is a, an associate professor in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town. He's come a very long way to be with us. Um, he's an experimental economist who does work with, with applications in health and game theory. <coughs> Sitting next to him is Dr. Harold Kincaid, who's also at the University of Cape Town. He is a professor there and also the director of RUBIN, the Research Unit in Behavioral Economics and Neuroeconomics uh, at Cape Town. And then sitting next to uh, Dr. Kincaid is uh, Dr. Jonathan Kaplan, who's a professor of philosophy at Oregon State University, uh, focusing on philosophy of biology, philosophy of science. He's written, but uh, well, actually, a number of these people, have, they've all written many things. But we'll <laughs> them. Um, all of them are here because they have expertise in various ways in, um, uh, in addiction. Um, you know, there was a time when people thought of addiction as weakness of will, moral failing, and uh, Many people have changed their view of addiction, uh, but this raises some really important questions about how we should treat addiction, what kinds of policies we should form around it, and so on and so forth. So uh, the hope for this panel is that we'll be able to uh, reflect a little bit on those kinds of questions. And so um, let's see, let's start by uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Hoffner to the uh, podium. Okay. Thanks very much for the introduction, Bill, and um, thanks to everyone for inviting me here. Um, today I'm going to be discussing the economics of addiction, uh, which was the topic of my PhD and is one of my primary uh, research areas. Um, but before doing that, I think it's important for me to uh, dispel some myths and deal with what I think is the elephant in the room. Over the last few years, when I've told people about the research I conduct, the, the most common question I get is, what does economics have to do with addiction? I can understand psychology and medical science, but economics? Well, what I hope to explain today is that economics is fundamentally the study of choice behavior in response to incentives. And there are certain features of addictive consumption that make it particularly interesting to economists and amenable to behavioral and experimental analysis. Now, I think one of the reasons people are often surprised to hear that I'm an economist who um, studies addiction is because a lot of people are familiar with the so-called disease model of addiction. The idea that addiction is a, a chronic, often relapsing brain disease that um, causes uh, compulsive drug seeking and use despite the harms to the individual and those around him or her. As you can see, it's endorsed by a number of major medical um, institutions uh, throughout the US uh, and the globe. Now, despite the widespread acceptance of the disease model of addiction, there's been a quiet revolution in addiction science over the last few years, 
which argues that it can and should be understood at a behavioral <coughs> level as well. Two researchers who share this view are the famous psychiatrist George Ainsley, who I've been lucky enough to work with, and Jean Heyman, who teaches um, courses on addiction at Harvard. In Heyman's book, as I pictured on the slide, he argues that addiction is fundamentally a disorder of choice in the sense that it involves voluntary behavior, and it is therefore worthwhile to try and understand it at a behavioral level. Now, when putting together this, uh, this slide, I, or at least this presentation, I put together a couple of, couple of slides trying to explain how these two accounts, the disease model of addiction on the one hand, and the choice based accounts of Heyman and Ainsley can ultimately be reconciled by adopting the appropriate levels of scientific analysis. The idea here is that addiction can be understood at both behavioral and molecular levels, and even though these levels put constraints on each other, neither can be reduced to the other. In other words, we would not want to adopt a reductionist approach to studying addiction where we only look for it and try to understand it neurochemically. There is potential benefit to understanding it behaviorally as well. But when prepping for this presentation, I realized it would take far too long for me to make this philosophical point. So I'll ask you to please take it on faith that it is worthwhile to study addiction at a behavioral level. Now, addiction is particularly interesting to economists because in many ways it's an ideal puzzle for economic theory. After all, why do most addicts expend resources to acquire their targets of addiction, but simultaneously incur real costs to try to reduce or limit their consumption of these goods? In addition, why is the typical course of addiction characterized by repeated unsuccessful attempts to quit prior to final abstention? From the standpoint of standard consumer theory and economics, these patterns of behavior are difficult to rationalize and have actually spurred a large theoretical literature on habit-forming behavior, of which addiction is the exemplar. And I should point out, these are just a couple of the papers, the theoretical papers in economics that deal with addiction, two of the authors of which have won the Nobel Prize, and a number of others of which are definitely in the running. In other words, addiction is very, very interesting to economic theorists. The issue, though, is that there's a paucity of experimental economic research investigating the preferences and beliefs that economic theory suggests may differ between addicts and non-addicts. Specifically, the theories on the previous slide implicate risk preferences, time preferences, intertemporal risk preferences, and subjective beliefs, in the causes, course, and consequences of addiction. So a research team of which I'm a member has decided to investigate whether these preferences and beliefs actually differ across addicts and non-addicts. We've studied gambling behavior extensively, and I think Harold will be chatting about that um, in his talk, um, but my research over the last few years has been on smokers, so I'll mostly be discussing smoking behavior. When it comes to studying addiction, smokers are really the ideal convenience <laughs> sample because they're easy to identify and recruit, at least in South Africa. And to the extent that addiction has a, a common behavioral signature, it shouldn't matter whether we run experiments with smokers or other addicts. Now, to determine whether these preferences and beliefs do indeed differ between addicts and non-addicts, we need to elicit them in an incentive-compatible manner which is a very important um, topic in experimental economics and one that I'll be mentioning in my um, presentation tomorrow. What this means in, in, its simplest, uh, in the simplest possible way is that people make real choices that have real financial consequences. This is so important because often what people say they will do is not what they'll actually do when faced with real contingencies. And I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. Whereas I would love to chat about all four of these potential behavioral correlates of addiction, in the interests of time, I'm going to focus exclusively on risk preferences and time preferences. Before I do that, though, I think it's worthwhile <coughs> to step back and ask, why do we care? And as the following in infographics I'm about to show you will attest, tobacco use and alcohol and drug abuse impose massive costs on society. The World Health Organization um, actually recognizes or, or classifies smoking as the leading cause of preventable death on Earth. It also uh, ranks alcohol as one of the um, 
leading causes of disease burden in terms of disability adjusted life here. And this final infographic by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime also shows that drug abuse imposes huge costs on society. Why behavioral correlates though? Why is that particularly interesting? Well, if you go onto websites like uh, the WHO, the CDC, the American Cancer Society, and you look up risk factors associated with addiction, it'll tell you things like men are more likely to smoke than women. There tends to be um, a, a link between level of education and tendency to abuse alcohol. There's often differences in prevalence rates across ethnicities and so on. Now, while that information is definitely um, useful and important, what we're interested in is behavioral correlates of addiction that cut across things like gender, ethnicity, age, level of education, and so on. Because if we can understand what motivates or what drives or what are the behavioral underpinnings of addiction, that should help us to develop better early warning systems and implement better prevention and treatment efforts. So that's why we ultimately care. In today's talk, I'm basically going to be discussing four studies I've been involved with uh, over the last couple of years. The first focused on time preferences of smokers in Southern California. The second focused on risk preferences, time preferences, and smoking behavior uh, amongst University of Cape Town students. The third is, was sort of an omnibus study where we elicited all of those four preferences I mentioned on a previous slide, and um, the paper is currently under review at a journal. And the final one is where we've actually attempted to uh, modify smoking behavior using a contingency management smoking cessation program. Now, I had originally put this together in Keynote, so this was supposed to be a video that was happening while I talked, but I had to output it to PDF, so you can just imagine stuff moving around here. This is how we elicit people's risk preferences. Okay, now, risk preferences are primitives in economic theory, and they define how we respond to risk and uncertainty. They're obviously very important for uh, classic economic decisions, like the sort of investment portfolio you want to uh, set up, or whether you should take up insurance. But intuitively, in, in the context of addiction, one would expect that people who are more risk-seeking may be more prone to try addictive substances and potentially to continue consuming them. Now, in the theory of choice under risk, the, the basic object of choice is a lottery, where a lottery is just a probability distribution over outcomes. Okay? In other words, you receive different amounts of money with different prizes, or at least with different probabilities, where I've done the conversions into dollars for you at the bottom of the slide. So basically what we do is we ask people to make choices between lotteries. In the study that we ran last year, they had to make um, 100 choices between 100 lottery pairs. We then randomly select one of them, and the subject then rolls a dice, and we pay them the amount of money that they earn on the basis of that dice roll. And as I think you would agree, the sums of money that are involved are not trivial, from $97 down to $30 in this particular example. On the basis of that, we can then estimate structural econometric models to see whether there are indeed differences in the risk preferences, in this case, of smokers and non-smokers. What did we find? I should point out that this is the only slide that I have that has a table with statistical results on it. <laughs> As an economist, I feel like I always have to have one slide that shows that I do structural econometrics, um, but everything else is explained in pictures. This picture shows that we found statistically significant evidence of inverse S-shaped probability weighting. That's represented by the dashed curve in the figure and was the pattern that Kahneman and Tversky um, argued would be the most common when they developed prospect theory. Basically, what it means is that people act as if they're overweighting low probabilities. So a probability of 10% is overweighted and treated as if it's closer to 20%, whereas people underweight moderate to high probabilities. The interesting thing about this pattern of probability weighting when combined with the curvature of the utility function is that you can actually explain the simultaneous purchase of insurance and gambling, which has always been um, a tough theoretical nut to crack in economics. Despite all of that, the take home here is that there are no statistically significant differences in the risk attitudes of smokers and non-smokers. Now this may seem like a re really counterintuitive um, 
finding. But I conducted a systematic review of the literature um, on risk preferences and smoking behavior for my PhD, and which was later published in this paper. And the literature is awash with conflicting results, where the dominant result is actually a null finding. In other words, no significant relationship between risk attitudes and smoking status. So let's move across to time preferences. Time preferences define how people value the present relative to the future. Okay? And intuitively, people who are more present-oriented may be more likely to consume addictive drugs or addictive <coughs> substances in general because the present benefits outweigh the heavily discounted future costs, at least in comparison to someone who's more future-oriented. Now, the way we elicit time preferences is by offering uh, people choices between so-called smaller sooner and larger later rewards. Where in this case, the smaller sooner reward is 400 Rand in seven days, or $67 in seven days, and the larger amounts are listed in this green column where they were paid out in 91 days. Again, we present subjects with a bunch of these different choices, and then we later randomly select one of them and pay the subject that amount on that particular day. We do that by electronic transfer so as to minimize any transaction costs that they would have to incur by coming to collect the money from us. So, what do we find? Well, this is a kernel-weighted local polynomial regression <laughs> with a 95% confidence interval, what my former PhD supervisor likes to refer to as a spaghetti plot, which shows the fraction of larger later choices as a function of the nominal annual interest rates on offering our time preference task, broken down by smoking status. Okay? And the take home here is that non-smokers are far more likely to select the larger later reward than smokers. Okay? In other words, smokers, statistically and economically, that's a subtle difference, <laughs> are far more impatient and far more impulsive than non-smokers they're far more likely to select the smaller sooner reward as opposed to the larger later. What's interesting is in a more recent study, we also included ex-smokers, and they discount at a level between smokers and non-smokers, which is pretty interesting if you think about the fact that they were smokers once, they obviously can't be non-smokers again, but they're ex-smokers, which places, their somewhere, places them somewhere between smokers and non-smokers. We also investigated the relationship between smoking intensity as measured by the number of cigarettes smoked per day and so-called discounting behavior, which you can think of as a synonym for impulsivity or impatience. We found this interesting non-linear effect between the number of cigarettes smoked per day and levels of impulsivity. Basically, as the number of cigarettes uh, smoked per day increases, so too does impulsivity, but only up to a point. And this particular nonlinear effect may provide some insight into patterns of cigarette consumption. It's long been assumed that the marked modal clustering around 20 cigarettes per day in mature smokers simply reflects the fact that cigarettes are, are typically sold in packs of 20. But it may be the case that cigarette companies learn to sell cigarettes in packs of 20 because that's where the psychofunctional and not merely the homeostatic equilibrium lies for the majority of mature smokers. Now, back to the behavioral puzzles that I introduced earlier. They suggest some level of time inconsistent behavior on the part of addicts in that they simultaneously want to quit but continue smoking and then they finally stop but then relapse. I am a case in point. I have not smoked for the last year and a half, but I smoked for about three years before that, and I stopped for about two and a half years before that. So I fit this classic pattern. I am time inconsistent in uh, the formal economic sense. In other words, if you were to ask any addict if they want to quit, they'll say, sure, but tomorrow. In other words, they have this desire to quit, but not right now, only at some point in the future. So what's going on here? Well, we determined, uh, using a finite mixture model, whether smokers were more likely than non-smokers to make time inconsistent choices. And as you can see, these are two kernel density plots of the likelihood of time inconsistency by smoking status. And the distribution 
of smokers is shifted to the right relative to non-smokers, implying that smokers are far more likely to make time inconsistent choices than non-smokers, which may be an important factor in addiction and explain recalcitrance to treatment. On the topic of treatment, I'm now going to discuss a study where we tried to actually influence smoking behavior. The previous results I've mentioned are purely descriptive. This is a contingency management study that we ran, which basically involves identifying an objectively defined target behavior, monitoring that behavior, and then delivering incentives for reaching the target behavior. We basically designed a low-cost, low-intensity smoking cessation program that we ran with UCT students in 2017. And the figure on the slide shows the basic setup of the study. We started off by sending out an email to all uh, registered UCT students with an online uh, questionnaire that they had to fill in <coughs> as an initial screen to determine whether um, they were eligible to participate. Those uh, who on the basis of self-report were eligible to take part then had to come in for an individual screening session. You could understand the problem here with a non-smoker wanting to take part in a smoking cessation program and earn a lot of money for not smoking, which is why we have actually had to determine that these were, in fact, smokers. Self-report doesn't quite cut it. So what we did was we used um, what's called a, a Bedfont Scientific Micro Plus Smokalyzer. It, it measures carbon monoxide in expired air. Uh, which is a very good way to measure smoking status. If you're a non-smoker, you'll typically have a CO reading of less than six parts per million. Smokers, when I was smoking, when I was investigating this device, I got up to like 30 parts per million. So it's, it's pretty sensitive in determining whether you smoke or not. After uh, we identified the um, eligible students for the study um, and they signed up for our so-called baseline session, we randomized them into treatment and control groups. And then they attended our baseline session, where we elicited their risk preferences and their time preferences, and they then went through um, a pretty lengthy questionnaire about their smoking history. We then took them into the so-called individual components of the baseline session, where a research assistant provided them with um, basically a summary of the cessation program, how it would work, that sort of thing gave them an aid to quit document and took their carbon monoxide and expired air reading. Subjects in the treatment group were then also told that they had been randomly selected to receive abstinence contingent incentives. Okay, in other words, if they were abstinent, we'd pay them money. <laughs> After the baseline session, subjects had one week to quit smoking. This is referred to as their quit window. And after that, they took part in four weekly intervention sessions, where they'd basically come in for a 10-minute individual session, sit down with a research assistant, answer a couple of questions, give a breath reading, and if they're in the treatment group and um, had a carbon monoxide level below six parts per million, they were paid an additional 150 rand. So basically everyone who showed up was paid 50 rand. Treatment subjects who were abstinent were paid three times that amount. And these are the conversions at purchasing power parity terms. I always do them in purchasing power parity terms because it's about six rand to one dollar in those terms. In real exchange rate terms, it's 16 Rand to $1. So it's incredibly expensive for South Africans to travel to North America, but these amounts of money are not trivial to students um, in South Africa. That took place across four intervention sessions, and then we followed up with the participants three months and six months later to see whether the intervention had an effect. What did we find? Well, this figure shows the proportion of people in the treatment and control group who are abstinent during the intervention sessions and then at follow-up. And as you can see, across the intervention sessions, the treatment group, or at least the proportion of people in the treatment group who were abstinent, increased markedly. By the fourth session, fully 45% of people were abstinent in the treatment group. And as you can see, this is far larger than the number of uh, people who are abstinent in the control group. Sadly, though, when we removed the incentives, <laughs> our abstinence proportions basically reverted to baseline, implying that incentives work, but only while they're in place. What was kind of neat, though, is that the program as a whole had a marked effect on smoking intensity, as measured um, by average cigarettes smoked per day. 
So the people included in this figure are only people who weren't abstinent at each of the sessions. As you can see, in the baseline session, people were smoking about 10 cigarettes per day on average, and this fell to about four cigarettes per day during the intervention sessions with a small uptick to six cigarettes per day in the follow-up sessions. As you can see, despite this uptick, there is still a big difference between um, smoking intensity in the follow-up sessions relative to the baseline session, which may be leveraged during their next quit attempt, or at least that would be the hope. So what are the next steps? Well, as I mentioned, we elicited the risk and time preferences during our baseline session. So we're busy analyzing whether these predict abstinence. Intuitively, smokers who are more risk averse and who discount the future at a lower rate may be more likely to quit, particularly if they receive these abstinent contingent incentives. Now, to the extent that this is true, cessation programs could be tailored to the risk attitudes and impulsivity of people to help them to quit. In fact, we're actually running a more um, ambitious smoking cessation study next year involving both UCT students and staff. The rewards on offer for abstinence will be far larger than the previous study and will also vary the incentive reinforcement schedules. I can discuss this in more detail if we have time later. In addition, we're going to be eliciting risk preferences, time preferences, subjective beliefs, and intertemporal risk preferences of our program participants to see whether these are related to the likelihood of quitting. Thank you very much. All right, so thanks to the Foley Institute and to Amy Mazur or Missouri? However you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> sounds fun. More. In Chicago, we say Mazur. <laughs> Mazur, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. And um, my talk's a bit more conceptual, uh, though I will refer to some empirical work for sure. Um, Basically, what I want to do is raise some skeptical questions about standard practices of addiction categorization or assessment. So I want to raise skeptical questions about how people are put into the category of being addict or not addict. Um, warning here, um, um, I guess I can give your, you your money back. <laughs> um, I'm not an expert on addiction policy, um, but I have done... Um, and continue to do addiction research and, and on gambling and on, I've written a great deal on the classification of psychopathology. Um, and so that's where I'm coming from, uh, in large part from doing lots of empirical work trying to decide who to categorize as an addict and who not, and what the causal factors um, involved are. Um, start off with some pretty big, broad um, statements about um, labeling people as addicts. Um, I'm not going to really argue for this, but um, this is sort of the way I see things. Um, the politics and policy of addiction is really part and parcel of, of and strongly uh, influenced by the social process of labeling, how people um, describe the behaviors of others. This is also true this social, um, the fact that the process of labeling is political or sociological, I think of mental illness. And addiction is typically considered uh, a mental illness, as Andre already said. Um, how all of this actually works, I don't know. It's a very complex process. Um, and so there's really still a big open project out there to be done. Uh, it really needs to be a collective one which is basically following individual behavior through all the social labeling and treatment processes up to policy levels, and then back down again to the individual level um, where the behavior uh, is influenced by this whole process. While that's a project to be done, what I can do is report on some pieces of the process that I've uh, studied. 
As you probably know, there's been a long debate over cent several centuries about addiction, and the debate um, is some, uh, whether addiction's a moral failing or maybe a little less judgmental a character flaw, or is it a, just a full-blown disease? This is, uh, has important consequences, as you, and, as you can imagine, on what, your attitude towards what we do with addicts, um, whether we're seeking treatment, if they have a disease, treatment's a natural sort of thing. If they uh, have a moral failing, then um, <laughs> same on them. Um, the current trend um, is to classify addiction as a disease, as a chronic relapsing brain disease. And there's an ongoing movement uh, to expand the behaviors um, that get classified as addiction beyond the, uh, those that just that involve um, consuming some substance. Uh, the DSM-5, which is the, the big um, encyclopedia of classification used in the U.S., um, used to count um, treat substance dependence and substance abuse as two different phenomena. Um, they don't do that anymore, but they can t certainly continue to uh, label addiction as a disease. In the introduction of DSM-5 a couple years ago, they expanded the, what um, addiction can apply to and put gambling in with the use of drugs open the door then to behavioral addictions. And now you can see lots of, in the popular press, etc., talk of obesity being an addiction, sex being an addiction, internet, and so on. I think disease models of uh, mental illness are in general prone to a social construction process uh, in terms of how they're treated and how they're labeled. Um, disease models of mental illness are generally quite uh, value-laden. A standard definition of disease as a, is as a harmful dysfunction. It's not purely a biological thing. It's something that we find harmful. It's a bad kind of dysfunction as opposed to just something that doesn't much matter. Uh, standard wording that, um, is that judgments have to be made about what's cl clinically significant manifestation of social relationships problems for different disorders. And both of those things sort of show you the role of values right in the process of diagnosing mental uh, illness. So I think it's pretty well established that how things get into the DSM, how they get out, uh, is in part a sociological and political process. Homosexuality used to be a disease, it's not anymore. Um, and there are a number of cases of this, a number of good historical studies that go through the whole process, the committees voting on what's a disease and what's not, the drug companies, etc. Um, and of course, in our own day-to-day -day interaction, it doesn't take the DSM, um, we make decisions about how we treat behavior and how we label that behavior, and that all has a big effect on what we treat um, ultimately as a mental disease. I think there's good evidence uh, that many behaviors labeled ad addiction behavior are not in fact chronic mental diseases at all. Um, we know that addicts are generally price sensitive You've raised the, the taxes on cigarettes and the consumption goes down. Um, same true for other drugs. So they're responding to um, the costs and benefits. Um, and typically, you know, you can't pay somebody um, to, to make them give up their disease. Okay, you have cancer. I'll give you a hundred bucks if you <laughs> stop it. Um, we know, as Andre said, paying people to stop has an effect um, for real mental diseases like schizophrenia. And, and this has been tried by the Chinese, for example, paying people not to act like a schizophrenic. Yes, it doesn't work. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay. Um, 
We also know that the spontaneous remission rate is high. That is, the number of people who at one time could be classified as addicts who stop on their own um, by natural processes is quite high. If you want a good summary of this, uh, Hyman's book, Addiction, which Andre mentioned, uh, is, is very readable and easy. There are four uh, U.S. nationally representative large studies, uh, one of them up to 43,000 people, <coughs> over different decades, and they all find that 75% are higher spontaneous remission rate. So that means the vast majority of people who have an addiction, an addiction problem are not chronic brain uh, disease cases relapsing and relapsing. Studies of Vietnam vets, and this is always kind of striking, um, especially for people of my generation, um, many Vietnam vets came home with heroin addictions. Because heroin was easily available, and if you were a soldier in Vietnam, um, you had a real <laughs> reason to escape. When those vets came home, the vast majority of them stopped using. Right? And what looks like is going on in both of these cases is that um, as people age um, and their social obligations and social commitments increase, um, those things are enough to change their incentives to get them to stop on their own. Okay. Well, the reason people have thought of uh, addiction typically as this chronic disease that you can't get over and relapse, relapse, is that they generally looked at treatment samples, people who are in institutions t trying to get treatment. <coughs> Those people are not representative of the average person who has an addictive problem. They're the worst, the hardest cases. So the group that I'm involved with, which includes Andre, um, believe off and on, I think, in what you might call a continuum of, of addictive behaviors. The people who get labeled in society as addicts are not homogeneous. The majority... Um, are transient addicts, and they have varying degrees of problems with the social environment that they're in, and the drugs, and the social environment, and all that. They're having some serious problems in life, um, but the, it differs from one person to the next, and these are the 75% that um, stop. Then the, our, our hypothesis is that, in fact, there's a small group, distinct from the majority, who are indeed classic addicts. These people have uh, repeated failed attempts um, to quit and add a great personal cost to themselves. They're paying to go to rehab. They're having to take off from work, etc. cetera. Um, these people probably have key neurological um, uh, signatures, key things about their brain, key neural adaptations to the drug. Okay. And then, obviously, um, I think it should follow that the prognosis and treatment uh, for these hardcore should be different than it is for the people who have a kind of problem in living who will get over it once they grow up and <laughs> get all those fun things like a mortgage and, and kids and you know, all that. Um, in particular, our experience with problem gambling um, uh, supports what I've just said. Uh, I was a PI on a, a national study in South Africa of problem gambling um, and have been following problem gambling for some time. Um, problem gambling used to have in DSM-4 one of the requirements or one of the criteria was that you committed illegal acts because of your gambling. I guess you'd knock off a liquor store so you can go to the casino, right? Um, that got dropped in the movement from DSM-4 to DSM-5, and the complaint was, by the psychiatrists and others, well, geez, there aren't that many of these people who've committed an illegal act. So th this criteria is preventing us from helping people That's because we can't call them addicts because they haven't you know, um, been doing illegal things to support their work. Um, 
if you look at the actual criteria for um, gambling addiction, um, you'll find that there's a number of things that are mentioned that are not really internal individual traits that look like disease states. There are things like people are, you know, irritated at me because they loan me money and I gambled it away and I haven't paid them back yet. And my um, significant other thinks I spend too much time away from home and those sort of things. But these are kind of social contingent factors, not the ones typical uh, of what you would think of as disease. Um, another thing we've learned in doing this research is it's quite a f fascinating world out there. And the political scientists will know something about this if they do population surveys. In fact, there are multiple screens for problem gambling designed by different people at different places at different times. They don't always overlap. That is, you can give the screen, they're supposed to be good um, judges of who's an addict, a gambling addict and who's not, but it, uh, if you give everybody, both of them, they disagree on who's the addict and who's not. Not a good sign, right? The screens themselves are a, a step away from what the DSM is. The screens actually sort of take on a life of their own. Uh, this is particularly true for, for this kind of stuff in clinical psychology, where you get one screen that's tested against another one, and you never know that there was a gold standard that it actually measured something. Uh, most of the screens have lots of social factors, like do people like what you're doing as part of the criteria. Um, there is, uh, in our work, we've seen evidence of a small group of serious gambling addicts uh, in the heterogeneous population of um, people who have gambling problems. Um, some of this is just anecdotal. Uh, casinos are known for having large containers for people to put their diapers in near the slot machines because serious slot machine players don't if they're on a run, they can't leave that machine. And so, like, yeah, you, you see how this works. They wear diapers. Uh, there's also a video of a, a casino in Las Vegas that was being robbed, armed robbery. And the CCTV thing is showing this. It's, and they go to the people who are playing on the slots, tell them to lay down on the ground, pull, and they're going around taking their wallet and their... And their uh, watches and whatever, but in the corner of the screen, one of the guys laying on the ground still has his hand on the thing. <laughs> He's doing like this, because he can't stop the, right? That's the kind of stuff that makes you think there's a special group that really has a serious problem, right? And then there are more formal uh, ways of approaching this. One thing we've done is what's called taxometric analysis. Um, it's a statistical technique, but, uh, but a special one in a way. Um, that can tell you if you've got a population of individuals with um, a set of indicators, whether that group, that set of individuals should be thought of just as a, you know, running from here to here in a smooth fashion, or whether there's a dividing line where you have one group that's distinctly different from all the rest. And when we look at our data, what we found, um, I won't explain to you exactly how these things work. Well, I will, very quickly. Um, the, yeah, the nerd in me can't help it. Um, <laughs> these things are cool because, think of this example. I have data uh, of a population of men and women. I have measurements on each individual for uh, baldness and height. I use these as indicators, and then I go take random samples from this, say, group of a thousand, and I take random samples. In subsamples that are mostly women or men, there's no correlation between height and baldness. But when the samples approach 50% men, 50% women, you're going to start finding a correlation. And that's an indication that we've got two groups, in this case, men and women. And when we do this, and we had published this, we find, in fact, that our data suggests, yes, there are those people who wear diapers uh, and, and use a slot machine even when their life is in danger, uh, and, and who are distinct from other people who just gamble off and on and have some problems. Um, so the general moral here is, I think, um, addiction policy discussion should not take 
much of mainstream addiction framework at face value. There's reason to be skeptical of the framework when you're trying to decide what to do. I don't know what the uh, policy implications exactly flow from this, but this seems to be a first step in trying to make reasonable policy. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm tempted to start out with a very long series of apologies. Um, one of them will be that I'll be sort of reading this talk rather than having a cool PowerPoint presentation. I decided to put this a little less formal, and that's how it fell out. Um, the other is that if you're one of the few people here who was at my talk this morning, some of what I said there is going to seem very familiar to you, and you, I hope you don't get too bored. Um, as a warning to echo yours, um, and I didn't have this in the paper originally, so I'm adding this in as well. I'm not an expert in addiction policy either. And in fact, addiction isn't one of my main areas of research. Um, about 10 years ago, um, Audrey Chapman, who works on addiction, um, her primary area of research, called me up and said, hey, putting together this book on addiction and uh, the research ethics surrounding you know, researching behaviors and genes and someone suggested that I really needed a chapter that sort of looked at a broader social context. They suggested that it should look something like your work. So I thought maybe you could do that. <laughs> so all right. Um, and that's how I got involved in this. And since then, I've written a number of papers with them. And you know, going, so that's the direction I'm coming at this from. All right, so I want to start out saying this. So this was about 30 some odd years ago, uh, Jeffrey Rose publishes Sick Individuals and Sick Populations, an article that's been uh, reprinted many, many times. And in it, he argues that there's this really important distinction between what he termed the causes of incidence. This is why a particular pathology, a particular pathological condition, presents in one population at a very different frequency than another population. And on the other hand, the causes of cases why within this population, this person got the disease rather than this person. They noted that oftentimes the causes of incidents, why is, why is this disease so much more frequent in this population than this one, are very different than the causes of cases, why this person in the population got the disease and this person didn't. And that usually these weren't in competition. But when you looked at trying to actually move population level health outcomes, causes of incidents were almost always going to be the place to look. That's where the money was going to be. That looking at causes of cases might help you with individual patients, but those were very rarely going to move the needle on population level health outcomes. Find the causes of incidents, affect those, you can move that needle. So as a little bit of an aside, I want to note that this distinction between the cause of incidents and the causes of cases sometimes lurks behind arguments about the root causes of particular pathologies. So one of the things on the flyer for this was that we were going to discuss root causes. Um, and I think that what you mean by something being a root cause depends critically on whether you're interested in the causes of incidents or the causes of cases. People who are focused on causes of incidence will often identify things as causal factors, as the important root causal factors that are completely missed by people who are interested in the causes of cases. So one very famous example, um, following some other people, um, Richard Lewontin famously argued that if you are thinking about the spread of tuberculosis in populations, why it reaches such levels of prevalence, what really explains why people get tuberculosis? looking at the bacterium was a stupid place to look. Uh, he thought that the real cause of it was going to be social and political organization. And he thought that, he actually argued, and people, other epidemiologists followed him in this, if you look at the rates of tuberculosis in populations, they track things like um, the degree to which people are living in squalid conditions quite well, and they have very little to do with access to antibiotics. Um, if you're interested in the causes of cases, though, that's not going to be terribly exciting to you. What you want to know is, oh, where did this person pick up the disease from, and what can we do to stop it in this particular patient? So in the end here, I want to stress that I'm going to be thinking a little bit about the genetics of um, addictive behavior. And I want to stress that I don't think there's anything wrong with studying the genetics of addictive behavior and addictive, um, and addiction. But I think that fundamentally such work only gets us at the causes of cases. I'll say the same about the economics of it as well. Um, I think this can give us a misleading picture of the root causes of addiction, and it might direct, 
attention, it might direct our attention away from um, the causes of incidents, which I think are where the real payoffs in terms of public health outcomes are likely to emerge. All right, so some super basics here. Um, well, this is going to sound like a broken record. We can hear you talk about this, but everything is heritable. Um, and within populations that have been tested, the heritability of addiction and addictive behavior comes out to around 50% when you measure it using twin studies and related things. For those of you familiar with the field, this won't be a surprise since pretty much every complex human behavior comes out at around 50%. That's just one of these weird things. Um, and also, when you've got reasonable levels of heritability, if you do a big enough genome-wide association study, you're going to find markers associated with the trait. That's also pretty much inevitable. Now, as a little note to that, for complex human behaviors, for complex traits in general, almost by definition, they're going to be massively, massively, massively polygenic. They're going to be influenced, if that's the right word, by many, 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 many different genes. So each gene will have a tiny, tiny association with the population variants, and each gene will also be associated with many, 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 many other traits. The studies of addiction and addictive behavior have mostly fit this pattern, with one little exception. Um, if you're looking at addiction for particular substances, you're not looking at addictive behavior in general, you're looking at addiction for particular substances, there have been some success finding particular genes that are themselves strongly associated with, for example, the receptors that are sensitive to that substance. Um, these don't explain very much of the overall variance of the population. So if you want to know why some people are addicts and others aren't, pointing to those genes isn't that helpful, but it, they do increase radically the risk in some individuals. Um, so I think they're also useful for looking at causes of cases. If you want to know why this person who was exposed to this drug under these conditions became an addict and this person didn't, possibly you'll find some hits for individual genes like that. Possibly not. So the big genome-wide association studies for addiction are a little bit behind the curve for giant genome-wide association studies in general. And there are reasons for this that have to do with it being a pathology. And pathology is being a little bit rare, so it's a little bit hard to get giant numbers. So not surprisingly, smoking and alcohol are the two that we've got really good ones for. Um, someone just did a pretty good genome-wide association study for alcohol use that had about a quarter of a million people in it. Um, someone else took that study and wrapped it up with some others in a meta-analysis that got about 400,000 people. Um, they've got some super good hits for uh, markers associated with um, uh, alcohol consumption. The markers don't explain very much of the variance. They they're, have a tiny effect. But when you've got 400,000 people, a tiny effect can come out to be very statistically significant. We're sure there's an effect, not a big one, but it's there. Um, the, this gets a little bit technical, but when you put all this stuff together and say, okay, all this stuff that we're pretty sure is really a marker associated with this disease, how much does that explain? It's pretty low. It's down around 6%. Um, so, alcohol consumption is about 50% heritable. You do these giant studies, you can explain about a tenth of that heritability by looking at these individual genes, maybe. And um, they didn't actually report their polygenic risk scores, which is never a good sign. Um, that usually means that those came out to be around 6% as well, and we were embarrassed by them. Um, they just had a pretty good one of cannabis consumption. Um, and there, they got a polygenic risk score of around 11, they explained around 11% of the variance, which is pretty typical. So this, they're following the standard pattern for human complex behaviors. Um, you do twin studies, you get about 50% heritability. You do these other kinds of cool genome studies where you look at people's overall genomes and say, how similar are they, excluding relatives? You get maybe 25%. You do a big genome-wide association study and throw everything into the hopper, even if it's not statistically significant and likely garbage, and you get about 11%. And then you look at the stuff that you're actually pretty confident of, and you get about 5%. We keep seeing this pattern over and over again. It probably doesn't mean very much. Um, so, short story here. For different substances and different operationalizations of addiction addictive behavior, we have identified quite a few genetic markers. Many of these are going to be false positives. Some are probably real associations. 
Some of these markers appear on the um, GMI associations for many different substances and behaviors that are associated with addiction, others for only one or two of these. Um, as I noted before, previous work on individual genes pointed towards some plausible causal variants for a very few genes, for a very few conditions, but they're associated with almost none of the variants. So I think this is basically, for the time being anyway, any genes we find are going to be causally so far removed from the condition that we're not going to be able to say very much about how they influence it. I think that's the likely pattern. Okay. Why do I think in the end these are really interesting projects in some ways, but actually not very important if our goal is actually to help ameliorate the real harms done by addiction? I'm going to stress, it's not that this stuff isn't interesting. And one of the articles I stumbled upon while doing this is a pretty recent study that finds this, I think, super cool interaction effect between being in a romantic relationship and how predictive your polygenic risk score for alcohol consumption is. Uh, it turns out that if you're single, the polygenic risk scores do a pretty good job of predicting your alcohol consumption level. If you're in a romantic relationship, that basically collapses. I don't know whether this is going to be replicable, but it's a, but it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating um, thing to have found out. So I think it's pretty cool. But if your goal is really to understand the root cause of addiction and to help reduce these very serious harms, I don't think that's really going to point towards the best avenues for understanding intervention. So before I move on, I want to have a really obvious note. Most people that have high polygenic risk scores for addictive behavior or who have the variants of the genes that are associated with being particularly sensitive to the substances are not themselves ever going to become addicts. That increases the risk but it increases the risk a little on what's already a pretty small risk, so your chances of actually being an addict, even if you score really highly on these, is low. And most addicts aren't going to have particularly high polygenic risk scores or these variants. Um, this is the sort of standard pattern that you see for all pathologies like this. These risks are associated, but the majority of people that have the condition <coughs> aren't going to be ones that score highly, and the majority of people that score highly aren't going to have the condition. As a way of addressing population level outcomes, then I want to suggest that looking towards high risk individuals is always going to be a poor strategy. I want to start with smoking because it is this great one because it's you know so um, common and we've got such good data on it. Nicotine's addictive, and we understand some of the key neurological pathways pretty well. There's variants in those pathways that are pretty much are pretty well associated with susceptibility to nicotine addiction and they do increase the risk of individuals becoming an addicted smoker. Within any population you care to identify, you'll likely find that smoking is heritable. And that heritability will average out to around 50%. There are populations where it's a little lower, populations where it's a little higher. There's some interesting gendered differences here. Um, at particular times when you look at heritability studies, sometimes it's really heritable in men and not at all in women, and sometimes that reverses. But if you ever have to bet, pick that number. Um, but now I want to note, peak tobacco use in the U.S. occurred sometime between the mid-1950s and the mid-1960s. And at that point, around 45% of the population smoked, and the average per capita consumption of cigarettes was up to around 4,300 a year. Now, the percentage of the population that smokes in the U.S. is down to around 14% overall. Wide variation between states, lots of subpopulation variation, but the overall is now down to around 14%. And per capita consumption is down to around 1,000 a year. Fewer people are smoking, and those that are smoking are smoking less. These changes obviously had nothing to do with pop changing population genetics. That's just not what was going on at all. This was all about public health policy. And we kind of can point to the ones. It's taxation, limiting where you can smoke cigarettes, um, limiting the promotion of them, things like that. Getting from 14% to much under 10% might be a bit of a challenge, but I don't think there's any good reason to think that we can't get it to just below 10% using much the same techniques we've used, seen before. I think that because California is just below 10% now and has done that using much the same techniques. Utah's a little lower. Um, I don't know that we can actually replicate Utah. But <laughs> <laughs> If you, look, if you look worldwide, what you find is that 
right now the countries with the highest rates of smoking look kind of like the US in the 50s and 60s, around 45, maybe up to 50%. And countries with the lowest rates look kind of like California today, just under 10%. Again, nothing to do with differences in sensitivities to nicotine between the populations, nothing to do with them having different polygenic risk scores. It's got everything to do with the policies and the economics of those nations. So even if within a population, most of the variation in trade is associated with genetic differences, the variation between populations can be, and often is, entirely environmental in origin. I don't think that has a ton to do with root causes per se. I'm not sure that we can agree on what a root cause is. But I think it does suggest that policy responses that aim at those environmental factors, those factors that vary between the populations and explain the population level differences, are more likely to be effective in reducing the real costs and harms of addiction and addictive behaviors than our responses aimed at individual <clears throat> risk factors. So, as if you're a good man, I think the, I just, you told me that the talk last week was on um, opioids in uh, the Midwest. Um, Northwest. Northwest, yes. <laughs> um, at the moment in the US, um, overall life expectancy has dropped for several years in a row. I think we're up to four years in a row now. Um, and the blame for this is usually attributed to the rise of deaths of despair. And addiction is one proximate cause of these deaths. Alcoholism and drug overdoses account for much of the increase in mortality and morbidity. Um, and many of the additional deaths that are deaths from suicide are wrapped up in addictive behaviors as well. While the spread of powerful prescription opioids, which was encouraged by pharmaceutical companies looking to maximize returns on a lucrative new painkiller, um, is surely part of the problem, most researchers agree that a bigger part of the problem is the failure of the economic and social systems that previously supported many of the people now turning to drugs and alcohol. Quite obviously, though, no part of the increase in deaths of despair can be blamed on changing genetic factors, nor on the frequencies of the sorts of neurological or other biological correlates to risk. I think that we might say some interesting things about um, changing uh, time horizons and um, changing assumptions about the future. I think as an economist, those would be very useful things to <laughs> start thinking about here, too. Yeah. Um, so I think that addressing these deaths in a serious way is not going to involve identifying individuals with particular high risk of engaging in dangerous addictive behaviors and then targeting them for individualized interventions. Rather, I think it's going to be about creating more healthy societies, um, curing, to use Rose's rather memorable phrase, the sick populations, rather than focusing on the sick individuals. And those sorts of interventions aren't really going to be medical interventions, as they're usually construed, nor even when it's focused on individual circumstances, but social and political ones. So I think here, we want to look at the kinds of social and political interventions that could create meaningful opportunities, both economic and personal, for people who currently lack them. That, unfortunately, requires a kind of political will that's currently in vanishingly short supply. That that's the case, though, makes it no less true. I think we should stop pretending that we can address any significant part of these kinds of serious social problems through attention to this sort of individual variation. Thanks. So we have some time now for questions. Yeah. I'll open it up to the audience first. Um, Andre, you, uh, your studies have used positive reinforcement to lead to certain behavioral changes. I'm curious how those that approach compares with the use of negative incentives and negative Sure. So, it, it, as part of that contingency management literature, the the, the one side, the side that we're uh, we've been focusing on is, as you said, positive reinforcement. The other um, uses deposit contracts. So basically, what people do is when they sign up for the the, the study, they deposit a thousand dollars in an account or whatever, and if they're not still abstinent after six to twelve months, they lose that money. So so that's uh, that's another approach adopted in the literature. The, the, the overwhelming finding there is that people are super reluctant to uh, take part. Surprisingly, they're not particularly effective. Um, there have been other, uh, other studies where 
people, they use like group incentives. So you're partnered with someone and you only receive incentives if you're both abstinent. So that's sort of a social value to, um, to quitting. And those, those are, are more successful um, when combined with the positive reinforcement. Um, but yeah, a, a, the, the, the deposit contracts are not as effective as one might think they would be. <coughs> yes. So this might be a bit of an odd question, but is there kind of a threshold or is it mostly just genetic factors in which uh, some sort of addiction takes takes hold on someone because uh, I, I'm also an ex-smoker and it is really hard to quit. Uh, but I've also gambled before and I've never felt particularly drawn to continue gambling. So is there an amount of time that people spend uh, gambling when an addiction starts to form or amount of time someone smokes before an addiction starts to form? Very good question. Um, and I, I think it varies a lot by substance or activity. So, I mean, smoking is just by far the most addictive substance, yeah. by far. And the, 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 that's why it's so great to study if you study addiction, because people who smoke regularly are addicted. It's, it's really as simple as that when it comes to smoking. Same is not true of most other substances. People recreationally use lots of substances and would not be classified as addicted. So I think it depends a lot on, on substance or activity um, that, that affects that sort of window of progression from experimenting to sort of, yeah, pulling off the wagon. Yeah, I can add to that uh, something I meant to mention. One of the, if you look at the kind of individuals that we picked out that are probably the hardcore addicts, um, one of their striking characteristics is that they have other problems. Depression or some other drug use. Those are the two big ones. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's the comorbidities, as they call them, which is a double whammy. It's a, it probably puts the people who go over from non-addictive use to worst case. So the whole idea of, sort of self-medication, it's often the case that people who um, you know, uh, are screened for uh, alcohol use disorder and, and you know, hit the criteria have these co-occurring disorders. Yeah, yeah but I, I'll, I'll defer from I think over. there's a guy in the back as well. Uh, yeah, from an anthropological or evolutionary standpoint, are there any theories you find interesting? Like, was addiction always such an issue in the human race? I haven't done a much work on this in particular. Um, so, one thing to note is that, for example, that, that nicotine is so addictive. Uh, has to do with the fact that it hits a bunch of really highly conserved receptors. And by that I mean that there's stuff that not only do most mammals have, but most animals have them. Um, and they're important for um, all sorts of other neurological things, and it just so happens that nicotine hits them. Um, and it's, I mean, the reason that plants produce nicotine was that bugs wouldn't eat them because it kills the bugs by screwing up their nerves. Um, and so it's, you know, this is a, it's a deep, highly conserved thing that just happens to in humans have this interesting effect because we figured out how to ingest just enough of it to have it have the effects that it does. Um, nicotine actually is the pleasurable effects of getting small doses of nicotine without immediately killing us. Um, there's nothing in our evolutionary history that said that that would be possible or um, certainly not guaranteed. If one can easily imagine a world in which no plants develop nicotine as a defense, in which we never stumbled upon it as a drug to use. Um, and I think that's true of most of these sorts of things. Um, I, don't, I don't know of any studies of addictive behaviors in so-called uh, traditional hunter-gatherer societies, which weren't, which aren't, of course, really traditional societies because they have just as long enough, just as long a social history as any of our societies. But people often think of them as a proxy for historical ones, and I don't know of any research into them. I don't, and it doesn't, yeah. What do you think? I mean, so from what to to, to sort of 
perhaps more directly answer your question. Uh, addiction is a relatively recent phenomenon in an evolutionary sense. So psychoactive substances have been used since the dawn of time, but addiction is, uh, they were typically used in like religious ceremonies and specific ceremonies and festivities or whatever. But addiction, at least to my knowledge, is, is relatively new in across the span of human existence. Um, so I have a question specifically regarding like the demographic of like myself. So like a college student who, which I'm sure you guys all know that there is a large epidemic of um, people my age using jewels and vaporizers. And even regardless that there is the numerous reports of like the lung disease, it sounds like people really aren't taking that seriously. And yes, there is public, <coughs> for example, you are not allowed to smoke on campus, and I can guarantee you that I'm <coughs> six people blowing out smoke every single day on my walk between classes. So um, it sounds like that from the past, when there was a large amount of people who were smoking, public policy was one of the main reasons to change that. But then in current society, like if anybody smokes a jewel, like there's nobody complaining. Um, and so the social pressure is not there, and also the public policy of don't smoke on campus obviously is not working. So from that standpoint, like if public policy is something that is supposed to work, <laughs> then like how, like what would be something that like the government or something could look into doing? If, like, if that makes sense. Sorry. It does. Um, so this is this is not an area of expertise for me. So uh, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit off the cuff here. But I mean, what's worked in the past has been raising the price and limiting access. Um, so those and those are things that are being considered. There's legislation being considered in a variety of at state levels now about limiting access and or taxing um, vaping devices. Um, so sorry, but yeah. my main rebuttal is one of the large issues with that is that people are just going to the black market, and it sounds like a lung disease is. Coming from those, um, I was going to say I never support limited access yeah. ever. I think uh, personally, this may be a very controversial um, statement, but I think all drugs should be legal but heavily regulated. I think limiting access, I mean, heavily regulated, was the idea. That sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I mean, you're you're right. I think I think the problem with uh, e-cigarettes um, in general, the jewels are e-cigarettes, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that they haven't been around for long enough for us to really know the long-term effect. There's a lot of indicative evidence that they are good for your health, but there is certainly no no medical consensus on that fact. And you know, really took the Surgeon General's report in when was it seventy-seven or whatever to start changing public opinion on smoking and public policy. And until there's really a consensus that e-cigarettes are as bad as a lot of people think they are, I don't think there's going to be enough of a push to to do what um, John was saying. Yeah. So raising prices. But I mean, I read recently that it's now illegal in San Francisco to purchase um, e-cigarettes or vape or the liquid or whatever that goes with it. So some places are doing it. So what, what has happened in California, Jonathan, that's dropped the um, um, smoking? Super factor? high prices and lots of laws regarding where you can smoke and where you can't. And it's social sanctions. It's social sanctions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's part of it. I mean, that, that, and this might, be a, this might be a place where vaping is going to be different. Um, that people that didn't smoke and didn't want to be exposed to secondhand smoke are very vocal about telling people that they're not allowed to smoke in places. If you're, if, if someone's vaping and not making a big deal out of it, <coughs> most people won't, either won't notice at all, people can be very subtle about it, or won't care very much. So that social sanction might not be there. Um, but the, you know, I think those were the keys. That high prices, lots of limits on where you can smoke. I mean, I remember when um, the smoking ban in San Francisco took effect. When it went from uh, bars, where it went from you could smoke in bars to the next week you couldn't. And it, obviously, all, bars didn't go smoke free overnight. Um, most bars ignored it until they started getting fined and they started getting you know, crackdowns. Um, but within the year, basically, bars were smoke free. And that meant that if you were a smoker, you had to go outside. Um, 
And that was inconvenient. And so a lot of people that would have, I mean, a lot of my friends that would have sat around drinking beer and smoking, smoked a lot less or didn't smoke at all because they're like, oh, I don't want to get up, get my jacket and go outside or leave it here and worry about it. It's just not worth the hassle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so how about, is there a trade-off of one addiction for another? In other words, you know, now that we have legalization, and you're speaking about uh, legalization of all drugs, um, we have legalization of marijuana. Do we see less addictions of other drug habits? Certainly, addiction hopping is a known phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, marijuana has a very low addiction prevalence, right? right. Yeah, but, yeah. But, it, but it could substitute well, for the effect that somebody's looking for in another drug. Sure. And it's it's just, it's been around to not long enough to have uh, been studied or? It's a good question. No, I, 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 it's it's not, nothing I've ever looked into specifically. Um, but yeah, I mean, as, as Harold was saying, a lot of, you know, when it comes to sort of the, the hardcore addicts, there's often lots of uh, comorbidities, so uh, a lot of other mental illness, and often uh, multi-substance addiction, polysubstance abuse, or addiction, they call it. So yeah, I think, uh, I think they're off, they're, often when you find hardcore addicts, there are a number of problems with a number of substances or other mental condition. Um, yeah, I, I suppose it de really depends on the substance because most so uh, most uh, hallucinogens and psychedelics and stuff have almost zero addictive um, tendencies. Marijuana also very low. Heroin, cocaine getting higher. Crack cocaine getting higher, and so on. And you often people, I don't know. It's really hard to to give a cogent answer <laughs> to that question, but it's, it's a good one. I'm too yeah, yeah, again. Yeah. yeah. No, we probably have time for one more question. Okay, I'll give you the last one. Okay. So you said that one of the best ways or one of the most effective ways to tackle the issue of addiction is changing policies and regulations. And that makes me think of Portugal's drug law a few years ago. They decided to decriminalize the use of illicit drugs. And they have seen positive effects. They have seen lower rates of overdose deaths and all of that. Why do you think countries have not adopted this law? The war on drugs. Yes. That's why. Okay. No, seriously. The, the US's war on drugs has dominated <coughs> public policy on substances all over the world for the last 30 years. It is very difficult to be um, on the good side of the US if you decriminalize drugs. And no one wants to be on the bad side of the US. In international organizations like the UN, the WHO, etc., the US war on drugs is the reason that things are as they are in most of the world, I would say. That sounds fair. <laughs> <laughs> no, because yeah, there, there are the, the exceptions, like Portugal, uh, like Switzerland, where, where they take really sort of uh, liberal views where, you know, they're, they decriminalize them, they, you know, provide treatment, their prevention, and they have seen really positive effects from that. And I think the whole war on drugs is starting to change, um, but yeah, that's really driven drug policy the world over for the last 30 years, 40 years. Well, on that, on that depressive note, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> our time is up.